things got quiet in here, so I, I guess it's time to get serious. Well, as Bob said, we do have a, a rich passage of Scripture here this morning. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we are studying this in isolation from Easter Sunday, because uh, there is a tendency with Scripture to have true truths. True truths are things that we know are true, and we just kind of set it on on the the, the bookcase, the shelf. It's kind of a, a a fact that we believe something we display is true, but we don't ever take it down and really use it. And at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is one of those true truths that we kind of set on the shelf and, and we, we look at it as a, a, a wonderful story, as an exciting event, as the focal point of the gospel, but we really don't take it off the shelf and apply it to our daily lives. And I, I think that's a mistake that we as, as believers, as modern Christians, tend to make and we'll look at that this morning. So... Um, would you, would you come with me before the Lord as, as we look into his word this morning? And let's open with prayer. Father God, we come to you. We thank you, Lord, for the resurrection. Lord, I pray that um, this truth would be taken down off the shelf. And Father, that we would this morning um, begin to, to just see the far-reaching implications of the resurrection in our life. And Father, that... Um, just the power of the resurrection uh, might be uh, increasingly manifested in us as believers. And Lord, uh, we love you. Thank you for your word that you have preserved for us. Thank you for your work through your son, Jesus Christ. And thank you, Father, for what you are doing in us, that we would be your witnesses. And Father, we bless you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you'd open your Bibles... Uh, to John chapter 20. We're going to start in verse 19 and go through the end of the chapter. And I'll read it here. So, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, uh, see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger, and see my hands, and reach here your hand, and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord. And my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these things have been written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. I think this passage uh, falls nicely into three sections and 
kind of break these sections apart and look at it section by section. First of all, it was just Jesus manifesting himself to the disciples. Um, then Jesus' specific appearance for the purpose of manifesting himself to Thomas. And then finally, really the concluding summary of the book, although this is not the last verse of the book. There's an addendum, there's the last chapter of the, the book of John, but John really kind of wraps up uh, the book uh, with the final verses of verse uh, chapter 20. And so we'll look at these three sections. And again, I'm not going to take this in a, a po polished sermonic uh, format. I'm going to kind of break this apart uh, kind of as we would do uh, in our personal Bible study because I think it's important in our uh, Sunday school time to really walk through how we, we take the, the, the scripture and we start picking the meat off the bones and start uh, um, you know, digesting it and, and, and learning what, what is there for us. So we'll, we'll just work through uh, this passage. Uh, verse, verse 19, we're looking at Jesus manifesting himself to the disciples. And it says, so when it was evening, on that day, on that day, what day was that? First day. And something more significant on that day, a day to be remembered. It was the day of the resurrection. I mean, pretty major event, pretty uh focal point of John remembering back and saying on that day and all the, all the believers the New Testament church were looking back and remembering that day when everything changed when Jesus rose from the dead on that day, that day of the resurrection and then lest we miss the fact that it was the first day of the week uh, he says the first day of the week um, it was interesting, Pastor Bob brought up the fact that um, this is really the origin of where we began the New Testament church and the church today continues to celebrate uh, our gathering, our fellowship, our observance of, of, of teaching, breaking the, the, the bread um, on the first day of the week on Sunday. Uh, this is really rooted in this, in, this, in this chapter, in this text right here. And we don't really look at that, we, we're, we're so focused on the resurrection when we look at this text, but really we see it here, uh, the mention of the first day of the week, and if you skip down to verse 26, what do we read? After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them, so they're gathered again. They probably gathered every day um, over that eight-day period, uh, just for support, for, for encouragement, but who appears eight days later. Why not six days? Why not five days? Jesus appears eight days later, which would again be the first day of the week. We have sort of a pattern establishing here. Uh, we see this continued in the, the book of Acts. In Acts uh, 20, verse 7, it says, on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread. It, 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 we never have a, a verse in scripture that says, thou shalt remember Sunday as the church to celebrate the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It somehow became the established pattern. In 1 Corinthians 16, 2, it says, on the first day of, the week, uh, of every week, each one of you should put aside and save as he may prosper. So we see uh, at the time of, of Paul's writing, probably 54 AD, some some 20 years uh, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the church is still meeting on the first day of the week. They're setting aside funds for, for the, the contribution to those who are in need on the first day of the week. Uh, Revelation 1.10, written by John, he, he says this, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. The Lord's day. So here we have, in the resurrection of, the, of Jesus Christ, really the seed, the beginning of why we observe the first day of the week, why we celebrate Sunday, why we as believers gather together. And we have, have really a, a pattern here of uh, the, the presence of Christ in the worship of the believers. 
So look at, at uh, just the, the, the events or the, the, the details here that are shared. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Jesus came and stood in their midst. Now, this is a verse that we sometimes like to go to in our, our, our folk religion, our, our ideas about um, resurrected bodies and say, you know, when we, we have a, a resurrection body, we'll be able to walk right through the walls and, and enter locked rooms. And, and I don't know that we can make a strong case that that's what the emphasis. In fact, that's not what this passage is primarily teaching about what the resurrected body is going to be like. The important thing was, who was there? Jesus was there. And we're told in Matthew 18, 20, where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. And so in this in this this pattern of, of, of the worship of believers meeting on the first day, Jesus comes and he manifests himself. He makes himself known. We see that again on the eight, eight, eight days later, when, when Thomas is there, Jesus comes and stands in their presence, in their midst, and ministers to them. I believe it's true of the church today, where two or three are gathered in his name, what? Jesus is there. So as we gather each Sunday, not that Jesus couldn't be with us on our Thursday night Bible study, or isn't with us on Thursday night, but there is a special way where the church is gathered, the believers are gathered, and Jesus is here in our midst, speaking to us, ministering to us. And what does he speak? What does Jesus speak here? Peace be with you. Now, I would tend to gloss over that. In fact, reading through this is really easy to do. But if you notice, this is mentioned or, or said three times. Jesus says, peace be with you, verse 19. And in verse uh, uh, 20 as well. Um, and then we see it again eight, day, eight days later in verse 26. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Now, we could say that's just uh, the Hebrew greeting, shalom, peace, um, that is merely a salutation, but I don't think Jesus wastes words, and when Scripture records it three times, I think there's a significance to it. Peace be with you. Jesus came and spoke peace. The disciples were gathered together, and they were there in part for support for one another, in part because the trials of life, the situation they found themselves in, there was real fear. There was real trouble. Their hearts were distressed. There was the question burning in each of their souls, what are we going to do now? And Jesus comes and he says, peace. He speaks peace. And I think that even today, as we gather together, the, the important thing for us to hear from our Lord and Savior is him speaking peace to each other. Peace in the midst of the, the, the turmoil of life. Peace in the midst of the struggle with sin and the struggle with, with just relationships in everyday life. But more importantly, peace with God himself. Think back to the angelic announcement when Jesus was born. Shepherds are there. They see this startling vision of the angels and that being a fearful thing, the, the messengers of God being there, angels can come to bring judgment. I think back to Old Testament times, uh, the angels appeared to, to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Angels could come to bring judgment, but what did they announce? Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth, good will toward man. And here Jesus comes. And he speaks to his disciples as they are fearful, but more importantly, speaks of the work that he has just accomplished on their behalf, announcing peace with God 
and his good will towards them. And that's what we need, don't we? More than anything else in the circumstances of life, what really, truly matters is where we stand in relationship to God. If there's not peace there, there's not going to be peace anywhere else. I mean, you can have the most wonderful uh, relationships in your life, and if you do not have peace with God, you're going to be empty, you're going to be tormented, there is not going to be peace in your soul. And yet, and I think this is the power of the Christian life, when there's peace with God, even though every circumstance around us is falling apart, the believer is able to manifest or to, to portray the reality that everything is okay. That life is just fine because I have a right relationship with God. It doesn't matter all these other circumstances. If my heart is right with God, that's all that truly and finally matters. It's not that we neglect relationships or the circumstances of life. It is it's the power of our testimony that even in the midst of trials and tribulation, a believer can have peace and it can exhibit that peace that only Christ can bring. That is a powerful testimony that we as believers have. And so Jesus comes and he speaks, peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Uh, Jesus here is proving or showing the evidence, number one, that it, it is he, it is Jesus indeed, the crucified one, and number two, that he is truly resurrected. John, uh, again, doesn't make a lot of, uh, of emphasis or put a lot of em emphasis on this point, but we have that in the other, other Gospels. In, in Luke 24, um, Jesus says, See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Just a quick side note. This is part of why I say I don't think that this passage in John teaches that we can, in resurrected bodies, go through physical obstacles because Jesus said, I have flesh and bones. Now, it's possible that you know, there's some material difference to a resurrected body than our earthly bodies, but Jesus is saying, it's me. It's, it's really me, the same individual, not someone that looks like me, not a spiritual manifestation of me. It is me, flesh and bones, same markings. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, Have you anything to, here to eat? And he gave them a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Why that detail? Because it was really him. It was a real body. He was really alive. It's not a ghost. It's not a spirit. This is a real resurrection. Again, it's a true truth that we believe as Christians, and we take that, we set it on the shelf, and it's like a trophy, and, and yet, do we realize that this is the pattern, this is the first fruits, as the Bible says, of what we shall also be like. This is the, this is the evidence, or uh, the, the first product that rolls off the line of a resurrection, and that we as believers are going to share in that resurrected body and life, and then there are many ways in which we do share. Let me ask this question. How does the resurrection impact your thinking and the way you live on a daily basis? And let me back up and maybe say, I approach the question this way, and I'll give this to you as a challenge to be thinking about in the next couple of weeks as we uh, approach Easter Sunday. If you were to share the gospel with someone, would you mention the resurrection of Jesus Christ in your gospel <coughs> message, your gospel sharing? You know, as, as Christians, we make a lot of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and his death and what is accomplished in the death of Christ. And in some ways, we're kind of like the Catholics and the crucifix and Jesus is still on the cross. And in our thinking, we, we focus on what was accomplished in the cross. But if you read through the New Testament and the gospel presentations in the New Testament, they speak of the cross, but the focal point is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the proof that the death on the cross was, here's a big theological term, efficacious, that it was effective, that it, <coughs> it, it produced the, the intended result. What would happen if there wasn't a resurrection? How would that impact our theological understanding of what was accomplished? Jesus died for my sins on the cross, and yet was not raised. There was no resurrection. <laughs> what's, what's the benefit? Yeah, fair. There's no, no resurrection. We're all still in our sins. We're still in our sins. And I want to I wanna, uh, think about that because that is, is really the crux of, uh, of the question. We're still in our sins. How do we know for certain that the penalty for sin was actually fully paid? What if in order to atone for my sins, it took the death of Christ plus my own effort, uh, my own self-sacrifice. He sent the Holy Spirit. But the resurrection is the stamp or the proof that it's been paid in full. That the sin issue has been fully dealt, dealt with. That the sacrifice of Christ is efficacious. It is fully... Um, pay the full measure of justice before God. So that the, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is, has far-reaching implications. I want to look at just a, a couple of those. So um, we, we said that without, without uh, the, the resurrection, what's the hope for us as Christians? We're, we're most to be pitied. If there's nothing more than this life, I mean, we already looked at the disciples and 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 the, the life that they lived. They that all of them except for John died a martyr's death. If that's all there is to life, we're not getting rich from this. We're not getting famous. We're not getting our benefits, our 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 reward here. We are looking for a, a greater reward. So uh, that is. One of the, the many effects of the resurrection. So, the resurrection is more than just a happy ending to a sad story. It's more than just good triumphing over evil. In the resurrection, we have the full and final proof that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. Right? Oh, uh, we, we said... You know, raising Lazarus was the pinnacle of, of Jesus' miracles. Well, how about raising yourself from the dead? Yeah. That is the full and final proof that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, it is proof that sin has been fully atoned for. And that Christ has gained the victory over sin. We, we see this, uh, Paul argues this in Romans uh, chapters 6, 7, and 8. That not only has sin been dealt with, but the life that we now live is a life that's united with the resurrected Jesus Christ. And that same power that raised a dead man to life is the same power that's working in a sinful, fallen human being with sinful patterns and a sinful flesh to deal with. It's the same power that is working in us as believers, giving life to us. And that resurrection life is impacting our lives. It is proof that eternal life has been truly secured and that there is a resurrection hope. And so, I want you to be thinking about how 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ should impact the way in which we share the gospel. It should impact the hope that we have every morning as we get up and once again put on our socks and our shoes and go about our daily routine. Wait a second. Jesus rose from the dead. And there is more than the routine, endless routine of this life. There is more than the labor of this life. What is the reward I look for? You know, the paycheck at the end of the week. What is it that motivates me to keep going? Is it the hope of the resurrection? That one day, this earthly body with all its aches and pains and frailty is going to be swept away and I'm going to have a new resurrection body with wounds that don't bleed, that testify of the great power of God in my life. The resurrection is something that should, should be in, in our hearts and our minds. That we should uh, take off the shelf and, and realize that this is for us. This is a, a truth that impacts us even more than the death of Christ upon the cross. And so Jesus shows to them his hands and his feet. It's interesting that Jesus still bears those marks. I don't, I don't know if our bodies will still bear the wounds and the scars that we have. But in Revelation, we, we see Jesus appearing as the lamb who was slain. Jesus bearing the marks in his body as a, as a, a um, eternal memorial to what it is that he has done on our behalf. And then Jesus commissions the uh, disciples, and we, we often go to the Great Commission in Matthew 28. And actually, all the Gospels, there is a commission, some, some clearer, some, some less clear. This is, this is the Great Commission in the Gospel of John. Uh, Jesus said uh, to them again, verse 21, peace be with you. He emphasizes that again. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. I send you in the like manner, in the same manner as the Father sent me. How did the Father send the Son? We've seen that a lot in the Gospel of John. Jesus has been very clear the manner in which the Father sent him. Quick review time. Anybody? How did the Father send the Son? Think about how he was born. How did the Father send the Son? As a human being, okay? And therefore, we are to minister as one human being to another human being, not as little more spiritual and higher plane individuals to less spiritual, but human to human, person to person. Very good. How else did the Father send the Son? As a servant, with great humility, he could have sent the Son as the King. And you know, there's a lot of popular teaching that we should live as children of the King, and therefore we deserve, you know, all the the benefits and the good things of this life. Jesus sends us as the Father sent him. If, if the Master was born in a stable, had no place to lay his head, why should the, the servants of the master expect better than that? This should affect the way we're thinking about every day. As the Father sent me, this is the same way we are commissioned as followers of Jesus Christ to be going out. And that, that word sent uh, is 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 that we are the messengers, that, that we are, um, that we are the, the ones that are the, the sent out emissaries of or representing uh, Jesus Christ himself. So how else, real quickly, anybody else? How did the Father send the Son? As a lamb among wolves. As a lamb among wolves. Um, so we have 
the, 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 the attack of, of the world around uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the opposition, the hostility of the word, world, and yet there was power, wasn't there? And there was truth, and there was clarity in the midst of this opposition. So as we think of, about what is my role as a believer, how am I supposed to carry out the Great Commission, we need to remember, we are sent just as, in the same way as the Father sent the Son. Take two in the Gospel of John, over and over again, Jesus said, I never speak except what the Father is telling me to say. I never do except what I see the Father doing. In the same way, those are the things that I do. And, and as Christians, I think sometimes we tend to have very spiritual ideas of what it looks like to carry out the Great Commission. What it looks like to be an effective witness for Christ. And yet, Jesus was simply doing what the Father set before him that very day. Jesus spent time seeking the Father's face to know what it was that he was doing. And then he did it. And I think that living out our Christian witness is simply seeking and abiding and then doing what the Father has before us to do. So Jesus commissions them, and he says, As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Interesting. Here John describes the giving of the Holy Spirit as coming at that time. I don't know if he is he is detracting from the day of Pentecost. Uh, Acts, uh, let's back up, Acts is written by the author Luke, and Luke was very much influenced or, or uh, writing the penman of the Apostle Peter. Um, Luke went back and made very detailed uh, investigation. He was the investigator, the doctor, the scientist that went back and talked to all the original sources. It was Luke who talks about Mary pondering things in her heart. Well, how does, how does an author know that someone pondered something in their heart? You know, he had to, gone, had to have gone back and talked to that original source. He had to have talked to Mary to know that she pondered it in her heart. And so, Luke, in writing the account of, of the day of, of Pentecost in the, in the book of Acts, very much is, is writing from the perspective of, of Peter. And I'm not detracting from the day of Pentecost and the significance of it. It seems interesting here that John doesn't mention the day of, of Pentecost, but mentions the Holy Spirit being uh, given here or breathed out by Jesus. Perhaps this was just a, a temporary um, um, empowering of the ministry of the Holy Spirit and that it came uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, was more powerful or, or more permanent on the day of Pentecost. But uh, interesting here, Jesus breathing out the Spirit of, of, of God coming from Jesus Christ himself to the disciples. For what purpose? What had just come right before that? The commissioning to be witnesses and being sent out and the Holy Spirit coming for that purpose to empower them, to embolden them, to give them utterance. Luke records that their minds were opened at this time to understand the scriptures. And that very clearly is one of the works of the Holy Spirit is to, to take and unlock the scriptures so that we might understand them. And then in verse 23, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Now we have to be careful as we read scripture 
not to go off on tangents. I think we talked about this in the message. Um, it's important when we're interpreting scripture that we keep it in context. We talked several weeks ago about the three most important rules of interpreting scripture are context, context, you guessed it, and context. And so we need to take this passage and keep it in the context of Scripture. On face value, it almost seems like Jesus is saying that you, as believers, have the ability to forgive people's sins, and if, in your estimation, in your sense of justice, it was worthwhile to retain somebody's sins, that you could also you know, block them somehow from having their sins forgiven. That seems like the clearest understanding that, of this if we take it on, on face value. But that doesn't fit with the context of Scripture, does it? So to properly understand this, we have to keep it in the context of Scripture. Some have, have said, well, you know, this is a, in, in, um, in context with Matthew 18, this is kind of like the keys of the kingdom where... Jesus gives to Peter the keys of the kingdom, that if you bind anything on earth, it'll be bound in heaven. If you loose anything on earth, it'll be loosed in heaven. Well, we have some context there, but again, I think that that's weak uh, in its in interpretation. Some have, have said this is referring to church discipline, that as, as a church that we have some authority over, over the, the body, and that there is you know, that there is some, some ability to, to um, exercise judgment within the church. Again, this seems to, to, to not have a clear connection. Context is an important tool for interpreting. And we have to keep things in context of Scripture and in the context of the book it's written in. But if we look at the immediate context, that should be our clearest clue as to how this should be interpreted. And in the context, the immediate context, we have Jesus commissioning the disciples. And I think this has very much to do with the power of the gospel. And let me explain that. First of all, we see in the New Testament great boldness in preaching the gospel and declaring that people's sins are forgiven. You, you think about that in, in, in the setting of a Jewish system where in order to have your sins forgiven, you had to do the sacrifices, you had to have the cleansing, uh, you had to go through the ritualistic uh, process in order for your sins to be forgiven. And yet, with great boldness, the disciples declare that by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins will be forgiven. That's a difference. That's a change. We see that in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost. Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Power, authority, full certainty that their sins will be forgiven based upon believing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I would say that this very clearly refers to the power and the boldness that we are to have in that witness, that being sent out, that declaring of the gospel. What about retaining the sins? Because it mentions if you retain the sins of any. Um, I haven't delved deep into this, but if you, if you were to look at the, the ESV translation, the English Standard Version, it translates the verse this way. If you forgive the sins of any, they have been forgiven them. If you withhold for forgiveness from any, it is withheld. What that says to me as I'm reading that is to realize the consequences of not proclaiming the gospel. You realize as believers that we are the ministers of the gospel of salvation. The rocks aren't going to preach the gospel. 
The angels, typically, are not preaching the gospel. The trees, the sunset, are not preaching the gospel. We are the ministers, and if we fail to clearly communicate the gospel of salvation, the gospel of forgiveness of sins, then we're withholding that means of salvation. And it's not that we should use that as a tool to, you know, damn those that we don't like. It is a failure on our part to be the witnesses that Jesus Christ is calling us to be. I think as believers, it's very important that we get a grasp on the importance of our position as witnesses in the world, in the setting, in the relationships, in the context that we live in. That we are these ministers who are to be declaring the power of the gospel, and we have a responsibility to do that. Moving on. So that was Jesus manifesting his, to himself to the disciples. And then we have verse 24, but Thomas. Now, why is this necessary? Why is this even recorded? I mean, it's a cute story. Doubting Thomas. <coughs> I know Thomas. And I don't believe in Doubting Thomas. I believe Thomas was a skeptic, and God had appointed Thomas to be a skeptic to convince all future skeptics that this was an authentic resurrection. If you don't have the skeptics, you don't look at things as closely. And so here we have a skeptic, Thomas the skeptic. And really it is the testimony of Thomas that is the crowning point, the ending point, well almost. John was a good preacher, right? And preachers say, and in conclusion, and then go on for 30 minutes, right? <laughs> Because he does that here in the gospel. And in conclusion, I'm wrapping up. And oh yes, by the way, one more chapter. It, it's the testimony of Chom uh, Thomas, the declaration, my Lord and my God, that John really decides to <coughs> wrap up his gospel narrative. And so we have that here. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, uh, we understand from that literally meaning a twin, probably an identical twin, a ditto, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said, unless I see his hands with the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his sides, I will not believe. Now, I think he was saying, you guys have been through some emotional emotional things. Your, your, your emotions are a little ragged right now, and you're probably you know, getting carried away. You probably have some vision, but I need some tangible evidence. I need something tactile that I can feel, that I can touch, that I can see hard proof. And Thomas the skeptic provides that crowning testimony that this is really Jesus, real in the flesh and the blood, and Jesus appears. Notice Jesus doesn't rebuke him. I mean, he does the gentle rebuke. Now do you believe? But he offers to him, reach here, your finger, put it in, in the wound. Reach here, your hand, put it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. And really, that is an instruction not just to Thomas, but to every individual. Don't be unbelieving but believe it. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. My Lord, because of the reality of this resurrection and who it proves you are, I fall on my knees before you and confess that you are the master. Not only are you my master, my teacher, the one who has authority over my life, you are God. This, beyond anything else, proves that you are God. You are not just a man, not a good man, not just a good man. You are God in flesh. And then Jesus concludes, Blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. And who's that speaking of? You. 
every one of us. We haven't reached our hand and touched the wounds on Jesus, and yet we believe the testimony of these witnesses. And Jesus here is blessing each and every believer throughout the ages. They will believe based on the testimony of these 11. And he blesses us. Blessed are you who did not see and yet believe. And then the conclusion, the summary conclusion. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written. In other words, John's saying, I could go on and on. I could continue preaching for another two, three, four uh, books. I could continue giving you testimonies. But these are sufficient. And if you're not going to believe based on these, you're not going to believe if I were to write more books about what Jesus did. These things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the, is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John has written his testimony. He has given his testimony for a purpose to motivate his audience, you, to a desired conclusion. And what is that conclusion? And how hard is that conclusion? What is the conclusion? Believe. Faithful followers, which is, is translated what? Here, it's, it's saying, believe and live. That you may have life. In other words, we are to live out that belief. Evidence that belief. It's not just a, a mental assent to facts. I believe that Jesus was a historical person. I believe he died on a cross. That in itself is not belief. Belief that is true belief with, with fully grappling with who this is is going to result in a changed life. Isn't it? It's going to be a, a life that is lived out in, in the reality of who this person is. And so we are left with the witness of the disciples, the witness of John. We are left with his desire, his intended conclusion. And each day, we have this choice. Each moment, we have this choice. Am I going to believe? And am I going to live it out? Is it going to impact my life? Last week, um, Ben talked about atheism and practical atheism. A practical atheist is a person, or an atheist is a person who believes that there is no God. A practical atheist is one who lives as though there is no God. And as Christians, unfortunately, we often live as practical atheists. We believe, we mentally assent and verbally assent that there is a God, and yet in our choices, in our responses, when there is fear, when there is uncertainty, we act in a way that contradicts what we say with our mouth. We act in a way that evidences we don't really believe that there is a God, that there is a Savior who says, peace be with you. So, John has written these things, that we might believe, that we might have life, that we might live the life that is consistent with that belief. And that is our challenge, to live out each and every day. Would you pray with me? Oh Lord God, we come before you. And we ask, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Lord, I live out the reality of what I know in my head and my heart. Lord, give us the grace each day to 
choose to believe and to act upon that belief, whether it's rational, whether it makes sense, whether it secures my future peace and happiness on this earth, may I choose to believe and act on that belief, no matter what the consequences, because I know it is worth it all when I see Jesus.